Welcome to Submarine Live. We've been enjoying a great week of exploring deep ocean science and adventure with the Necton First Ascent team who are currently out in the middle of the Indian Ocean around the Seychelles exploring the deep uh, waters there with submersibles and other instruments. It's been really exciting um, connecting those scientists to you guys in the classroom and in schools across the world. We've also been having some live investigations where, where we have been looking at some of the STEM topics behind submersible exploration. Very sadly, this is our final submarine Q&A, but I'm delighted to say that we have schools watching from the UK, USA, Spain, Bermuda, Canada and Morocco. So fantastic to have you with us. And I know we've got some shout outs um, to give. Uh, we have Earth Class at Worksworth Junior School who are particularly excited um, about this Q&A session. We're very excited to have you too. Hi to Worksworth. Um, and Billy, Billy, um, who may be a marine biologist when he's older. Billy, that's a great idea and hope you can learn more about becoming a marine biologist during this session. Um, we have a shout out to Seven Truth and Seven Compassion from Nishkum School in West London. Hi there, really great to have you on board and you're currently studying pressure in science. Um, fantastic and good luck with your KAT2 exams. Best of luck to you and hope those go really, really well. We have Riverside PS, the grade one and two French immersion classes and the one two split class and a lovely message. Your teachers are so very proud of you. Um, so you're obviously amazing students and your teachers really proud. They're lovely to be able to share that with you on air. Um, Mrs. Roop's uh, fifth grade science students and I think you're being joined by Mr. Audia's sixth grade class as well. And big shout out to all those students um, joining from Jonesville Middle School in Lee County, Virginia um, in the USA. A big hello to you too. Thank you for being part of this. Um, and a shout out to Class 2B at the International French High School in Agadir. Um, we think we are the only school in Morocco taking part. and I think you probably are. Uh, and your school is very close to the ocean. Fantastic to hear. Um, very grateful for the opportunity to learn about the research being undertaken on the next mission. Um, and we also have um, third grade students watching from Willimon Steam Academy in Texas. Wonderful to have you <laughs> with us. Uh, Submarine Live, part of AXA Excel Oceans Education and we are beaming from Sonodyne HQ and Sonodyne, the amazing marine engineers who make all the underwater communications possible in terms of getting that data from submersibles up to the world. So really great um, to be here and very soon we shall be connecting, connecting in fact, um, to the Ocean Sapphire and that is the research vessel that's currently out in the Indian Ocean, and that's the base uh, for Necton First Descent. Um, and they've been out there for just over halfway point of their seven week exploration. And a squall has come through earlier today and is causing a little bit of tri trickiness uh, with the communications from the surface vessel, and we're just trying to raise them now and they should be online very shortly. We will be speaking to Jerome, who is a biogeochemist um, based out in the Seychelles, and we'll be hearing his uh, insight into the work that's being done and the science that's being done out there. Before we connect to the ocean sephir, let me just uh, explain the importance of Necton First Ascent and where it gets its name from. Now, when you're exploring the ocean, you're exploring the first uh, 30 meters of ocean using scuba gear, using aqualungs, and so that gives you a sense of that very, very top layer. Now, if you want to, to explore anything deeper than that, you are going to need other 
types of technologies. Now the technologies that the Nectin team are using are two things. First of all, they're using these submersibles um, and we'll have some shots of those a bit later during this session. Um, submersibles, an amazing um, pressure hull, clear pressure hull, and that allows the uh, submarine pilot and the scientist going down with them, an unrivaled view of the underwater world, and that takes you down to 250 meters. Now, even further down to 500 meters, uh, the team are using something called an ROV. An ROV stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle, uh, in case that's a new term for you. And this is basically like a robotic uh, submarine. Um, I've got a small one here, which I'll just hold up. Uh, and you can see that it's got a small camera at the front there. Um, and that allows a video feed um, to go via uh, cable back up to the surface vessel. And the ROV that the team are using uh, can go down to 500 meters. Now, so we've gone from zero to 30 with scuba gears. I mean, technical divers can actually get down to about 100 meters. Then with the submersibles, we're going down to 250 meters. And then even further, 500 meters with the ROV. And this may sound like it's really deep, and it does increase our understanding of the ocean and it gives us that information and sense of wonder of the deep. But to put that into context, the deepest part of the ocean is the Marianas Trench, the Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench. And that is an amazing nearly 11,000 meters deep. And it's an extraordinarily, you know, pressurized place, very difficult to explore. To give you a sense of the pressure down there, imagine this. So I'm going to ask you all to imagine to take off a shoe and a sock. Don't take them off in the class, but imagine taking that off. Imagine in the other hand you have the Eiffel Tower. And being immensely strong, what you can do is you can take the Eiffel Tower turn it upside down and put that point on your big toe and that is the pressure that is felt um, at 11,000 meters. So that's 1,100 times the amount of pressure as you feel at sea level. Now there are only three people who've been down to that, um, that deepest point of our ocean and that was Don Walsh and Jack Picard in the Trieste in 1960 and the code name for that project was Project Necton, and that's where the Necton team have taken the inspiration from for their name. And then recently we had the film director James Cameron go down in 2012. There is another mission that is attempting to go to the deepest point of every ocean, that's the Five Deeps expedition, so do have a look online for Five Deeps a really inspirational uh, expedition looking at the deepest point in each of the oceans. Now we're just gonna be getting the expedition team online shortly. Um, I know that um, the storm has caused um, problems and so running repairs um, being done. So very shortly we should have Jerome uh, coming online to talk about um, life and science on board the Necton First Descent mission. I'm just gonna sort of have a look at some of those questions uh, that, that are being sent through. And it's a really, really great privilege to be able to take those questions. I know you work really hard to come up with those um, questions for the scientists. Um, here we are. Um, let's see this one coming down here. Um, just, I'm just going to take this first, first question and it's from Samvir at Nishkam School. Hi Samvir, um, thank you for sending uh, your question through. And it's, do you see any plastic in the ocean and does it affect the animals? Um, 
Samvit, that's a really great question. So let's look at this. So in terms of seeing plastic in the ocean, there's sort of two types of plastic to think about. First of all, there's the obvious plastic, the sort of like trash or litter that you might see um, lying around. And they haven't, the team haven't seen any um, of that plastic debris um, where they were on uh, Aldabra, that's one of the islands in the Seychelles. Uh, uh, but they did see a lot on the beaches. Um, so there's a lot of waste on the beaches, including a lot of flip-flops. The second thing that the team have been doing is looking at something called microplastics. And those are sort of tiny, tiny, tiny fragments of plastics in the water. Now those can come from two different places. Sometimes they are fibers of synthetic clothing when uh, you wash and, and all those fibers actually go out into the ocean. And the second is when larger objects um, break down. So larger plastic objects can become quite brittle in the sunlight and then the wave action breaks those down into tiny fragments. Now there are an estimated 5.25 trillion items of microplastic um, in the ocean and every single part of the ocean that we have sampled for microplastics um, they've been found. So that hasn't been, the sampling is being done at the moment by the next mission. They're dragging um, a, like a trawling net, and like a net through the ocean and gathering all the different particles and life that they find to find out whether those are plastics requires further laboratory analysis. So we won't know whether they found plastics um, for a good few months yet, but it's definitely something they are looking for and very sadly um, expeditions have not been able to sample a part of the ocean without finding plastics in it. I mean, there was a story um, that one of the team told me earlier this week of an ibis, a, t a type of bird um, that had its um, beak um, sort of closed shut by a piece of plastic. And very lucky, luckily that piece of plastic was able to be removed. Um, there's also stories of, of turtles um, mistaking uh, plastic debris for food. Uh, and um, on one of the beaches, there's a, there's a turtle nesting beach on Aldabra, and the female turtles coming, coming onto the beach um, to lay the eggs just couldn't um, because there was plastic debris in the way and having to search around for another area to dig a nest and really you know, a lot of extra energy being expended. So while the team haven't seen plastics in the deep, uh, there is definitely evidence of plastic pollution in the area. So, where are we? <laughs> um, just coming, coming, coming back. This is a um, question from um, Tyler. Tyler, thank you so much for this question. Do the people in the submersible eat meals when they are underwater? Um, Tyler, it's an, it's an interesting point and it brings up a, another technical piece uh, and that is uh, the difference between a submarine and a submersible. So a submarine is a vessel that can operate independently underwater, leaves port, goes out into the ocean, does its stuff, comes back. Um, like a sort of normal ship but one that operates underwater. Most commonly, um, those are used by the navies around the world. What we're looking at is a submersible. Now, a submersible requires a mothership or a surface ship to operate from when it's out, out at sea. And so they're normally smaller, and they normally go underwater for shorter amounts of time. Now, the types of length of time we're talking about here are anything between sort of two and four hours for the science dives being conducted by the Necton First Descent team. And I mean, they do have life support for up to 96 hours, so that's four days. But because you're down for a short amount of time, you're not really sort of <laughs> taking a meal down there. So you have uh, water um, because it can be quite warm and you can easily get dehydrated um, in the submersibles. Uh, the surface temperatures in, in the Indian Ocean at the moment at 29 degrees uh, Celsius. 
Um, I'm not quite sure what that is in um, Fahrenheit immediately. Um, someone's going to have to to help me with the conversion. Uh, uh, but uh, then there are emergency rations which are kept uh, in the submersible just in case something goes wrong and the crew are below the surface of the ocean for an extended period of time. So they don't eat meals, but there are emergency rations down there. Um, from Mrs. Sudlow, um, we've, we've got this question coming through and it's a follow-up question to have we seen um, plastics um, in the ocean? And the question is, is there any way to clean the plastic from the ocean? Uh, it's a really interesting point when we're talking about plastic pollution. And there's an analogy um, that one of the researchers has made, uh, and that is, you know, if you're looking at plastic in the ocean, do you try and bail out the bath or turn, out, turn off the tap? So we've got two things. We've got a lot of plastic in the environment, but we still haven't got to a stage where we're decreasing the amount coming in all the time. So there's two sets of solutions to look at, one of which is to decrease the amount of plastics coming into the deep ocean or into the ocean in general, in fact. And the second thing is, what do we do um, when it is there already? And in fact, you know, you look at some of the solutions being put forward, there are definitely beach cleans um, happening and, and, and that kind of thing. There's also sort of like mid-ocean um, endeavours. But it's only those mid-ocean endeavours only really looking at the surface and in fact a lot of plastic uh, coming through the water column. And I've just um, heard that we have, we have Jerome on the line from the Nectin First Descent Mission. Jerome, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, how are you doing? Can Jerome, you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Fantastic uh, that you're able to join us and I'm, I'm glad that the, the comm side ha has been fixed up. <laughs> We've been struggling a lot. <laughs> well, it's fantastic to have you on the line. We've got a great number of schools um, who are joining us uh, across the UK, USA, Spain, Bermuda, Canada and Morocco. Um, so they've got some wonderful questions uh, for you. Um, but before we dive into those, um, perhaps you could uh, briefly explain a little bit about your background and your role on Necton First Descent. Okay, <clears throat> my background is um, I'm a marine scientist. Uh, I'm doing a science that is called biogeochemistry, which is uh, basically to study the, the cycle of the major elements uh, through the ocean, which are carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, silicate. And uh, on board of the, the Necton cruise, um, what I'm doing, I'm interested in profiles of different parameters into the water column uh, to provide some insight about how biology starts in the ocean. So basically, I'm interested in the stratification of the ocean, how uh, the, the temperature and salinity contribute to the, the different layers of this coastal ocean we are here now. And I'm also interested in the parameters that indicate uh, active life uh, like oxygen uh, fluorescence, which is a proxy for the phytoplankton distribution, and also the pH and different parameters like nutrients that I'm sampling also. And so it's, it's really interesting, I find about the oceans, and I'm just gonna, I know we've got some of the younger students watching, is to, th to think about uh, in the ocean that we have this biogeochemistry, um, this area of research, and from my understanding, a lot of that is, is looking about the, the ocean, it's not just water, we have all these chemicals which are really essentially essential for life. So we have this biology chemistry crossover. Could you explain maybe a little bit about um, one of these chemicals and how it is uh, essential for life in the ocean? Uh, what is essential for life in the ocean first is the, the energy that the ocean receives from sun solar irradiance uh, and through some organisms which are called the phytoplankton, which are very small organisms, small plants living in the ocean. Uh, this energy is 
converted into biomass, into organic matter. And uh, this is my specific domain of interest. Uh, this organic matter is built uh, through the carbon that is contained into the ocean and is also built with the nutrients that are present. So we need different components. We need the light, we need the carbon, and we need the nitrogen, phosphorus, silicate, and minor, minor elements. Amazing, and, and, and I suppose that's uh, a little bit similar to if, if students have been studying life on land, you've, you've got the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, you've got the light from the sun, and then you've got those um, other chemicals that are present in soil. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly the same. Um, in, the, in the ocean, the carbon dioxide, which is present in the atmosphere, dissolves slowly into the ocean. So the ocean is rising its carbon dioxide as the carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere. And the phytoplankton uptakes this carbon dioxide from the ocean to convert it into organic matter. And yes. yeah, amazing. So there's phytoplankton, those, those tiny little algae, plant-like organisms, life that lives in, in near the surface of the ocean. Yeah, they need, actually, uh, we've seen this morning that uh, the, the distribution of this phytoplankton is contained in the upper layer of the ocean, but not directly in the surface, which surprised me a little bit because generally uh, they live close to the surface because they benefit from the light. But apparently here, uh, they live at around 50 meters uh, depth, which is probably the region where the light is less harmful for them because light can be also harmful for the phytoplankton. They need to protect themselves against uh, bad radiations like infrared or like uh, UV, ultraviolet radiation. And here, the way that they are doing that is by growing a little bit deeper than uh, in direct surface. Yes. Amazing, Jerome. We've, we've got some great questions coming through. I've got uh, one from um, Nish Nishkam School and we've got Amber. And Amber would like to know, what has been your favorite discovery? Oh, my favorite discovery. Um, when I put my probe into the ocean, which is called a CTD for conductivity, temperature and depth, it's a, a probe that we deploy from the ship and that goes to the bottom and come back. And, um, by looking at the, the results that I obtained, I could see that uh, we had very uh, interesting features in the ocean that I did not suspect, uh, that were linked to the, 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 the close interplay we, between the land and the ocean. So basically, uh, the water cycling on the land comes to the ocean uh, through the caves that are present in the, the, the calcium carbonate structure of the, of the land and uh, it is present in the ocean and we can see this signature by uh, dropping our instruments. Yeah, And that was very amazing for me because it links the life in, on, the, on land with the life into the ocean. And this is probably very important for the ecosystem that develops here to get those nutrients that are uh, leaked off the land uh, at, uh, at the, the depth where they uh, they are used by the phytoplankton. Uh, I, I mean, it sounds like an amazing to, to find those very special features in these environments. We've got some from Oak Class. We've got some amazing uh, questions. Um, and the first one is, is it true uh, that jellyfish uh, predate both dinosaurs and sharks? Have jellyfish been around for, for longer than dinosaurs and sharks on this planet? Oh, yeah, yeah. Jellyfish is a, a very, very ancestral feeling. Um, and uh, dinosaurs and sharks arrive just a little bit later after the Cenozoic era. Yes, of course. So good old jellyfish. And uh, they would also like to know whether you have found any dinosaur fossils in the ocean. Unfortunately, I didn't. But uh, I'm very fond of museums, and in some museums that I've uh, visited, I've found some bones, some fossils of dinosaurs that were living in the ocean, yes. 
Uh, incredible. Um, this is another question from, from Nishkam School, and this is um, from Kian. Um, what, is, what are the submersibles that you're using? What are they made out of, and why don't they sink? Oh, <laughs> I'm, not, I, I, I'm not a specialist of submersibles, but uh, um, the, the submersibles that we use now, uh, fortunately, we may see them because I see that, no, probably not today. Um, they are made of a big bubble of, um, of glass in which the, the, the pilots and his co-pilots are. And uh, it's made of two uh, structures around where we can vary the pressure of air to control the buoyancy of the of the of the, um, the subs, uh, and the subs are positively buoyant, so they 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 are floating naturally. And when we push the air outside those um, those structures, the, the the sub is going down into the ocean, and then it's very tricky for the pilots to control the the level of this uh, the depth that is rich because it can go deeper but we are limited by a, a certain certain conditions of pressure because uh, if the pressure becomes too high then we can have leaks we can have some issues with some structures that are present outside and uh, we control this by uh, looking at the pressures inside and outside and to, to, to adjust the the buoyancy of the sub uh, with respect to the the depth we want to reach yes uh, and they look like they are uh, amazing machines in so far as that they, they, you have this round sphere made out of this uh, eight centimeter acrylic um, and gives the scientists in there a, a really unrivaled view of, of the deep ocean. I know other materials use sort of metals, um, epoxies, resins, that kind of thing uh, to, to survive in the underwater world. Um, the next question, this is from Sophia, um, and asking on the mission, how often do the submersibles uh, go under the water? Um, generally, we go into the water once a day. Uh, sometimes we go twice a day uh, when we have uh, to do some transects or some collections of organisms at depths where divers cannot reach because of the physiological constraints of the human body. So we generally use the subs to go to depth from 60 meters down to 250 meters. And um, we start in, in the early morning, we put the subs at sea and uh, they come up for lunch and sometimes they go down in the afternoon to, to continue the work, yes. So the, the, just hearing that, that really important ability the, the human body can't really withstand the pressure below sort of like maybe 40 meters, really technical diving to get down to 60, 70, 80 meters, but you've got these amazing submersibles taking you all the way down to 250 meters. Um, it's amazing stuff. I mean, Jesse um, looking at uh, a great question is there are these different zones in the ocean. Can all sea life survive in just one zone? Oh, sea life crosses different zones uh, during the day and the night. Uh, we observe some vertical motions of some creatures that we call the zooplankton, which are very small crustaceans that feed on the phytoplankton. So they are the first, uh, the first part of the chain. And those, phyto, those zooplankton, they live generally in the dark ocean, very deep. And when the sun is uh, going down, then they come up to the surface to cross the phytoplankton blooms and to feed on them. So we, we see different motions in the ocean. And um, for example, we, we've seen also some sharks uh, two weeks ago uh, that were mostly observed in the deep ocean. And we saw them in areas uh, where we, we did not expect to see them. Uh, we saw that with an instrument that is called the drop cam, which is a, a camera that we drop at the bottom of the ocean. Actually, it was 300 meters, uh, where we saw this very ancestral shark 
which is called the six guild shark. Yes. And six so shark. effectively, yeah. And I find it amazing. So we're, we're talking just before about the zooplankton, those tiny crustaceans sort of related to shrimp. And I've heard that that's the largest migration on the planet on an, on an everyday basis that we have, uh, you know, I think it's something like over a thousand billion billion of these creatures going anything from like 500 meters, maybe 200 meters up to the surface to have, have, have their supper or lunch in the middle of the night. Um, just, just before we move on, that there are even deeper zones in the ocean. Is life different down there? Oh, yes. Life is very different uh, in the deepest ocean because those, uh, those organisms never see the light. So they use other strategies to acquire, to sustain their energy needs. Uh, they can use the chemical energy by splitting some molecules and to extract the energy of those molecules and this provides the energy that is susceptible to to, to, to animate them yes uh, incredible and i think that uh, we all think that the only way life can can start is by this process we know as photosynthesis getting energy from the sun but around the sort of underwater vents uh, that we have something called chemosynthesis where we're, there's this chemical energy that generates light, uh, life, even when there isn't any light. I mean, it's mind-boggling to think about that. Yeah, it's it's a very it's a very recent discovery. In fact, uh, I think the the first observations and the first description of those uh, of those organisms, the chemiotrophy, uh, is back from the early 80s. So it's it's quite recent in the history of. Uh, ocean discoveries, yes. And may even be how life began on this planet. Oh, the, the hypothesis for life to begin on this planet has multiple, and of course, yes, uh, this chemotrophy can, can be uh, explaining some of the facts that we observed in other experiments, where we tried to create uh, prebiotic pre molecules, uh, based on atmosphere and by providing them some energy. And we discovered that RNA, DNA, and those complex molecules could be uh, self-sustaining in certain conditions. And symbiosis, which is the combination of different organisms to support the same goal, uh, is one of the keys of those uh, interactions and the, the supply of energy to those organisms that live very deep inside the ocean. So lots of different ways that it could have happened, but these, the, the fact that there were these sort of like these um, pre-life um, sort of like uh, organisms almost, uh, really, really exciting to hear. Um, just some, some more sort of like focused questions on the expedition. Um, Severe from uh, Nishkin School would like to know what is the greatest depth that the vessel has reached on this expedition? Oh, uh, with the submersible, we went down to 250 meters, where almost no life uh, is, uh, has been observed compared to the surface, of course. Um, and uh, the ocean around us is 5,000 meters, but Technically, we cannot reach those depths with the uh, with instrument that we have now. So we focus on the on the zone actually that is between 250 and the surface, which is already a, a very very nice performance. It's very challenging. And I think you know that that's known as a twilight zone. So you have the sort of sunlit zone near the surface, and then you have the, that twilight zone, that almost dark um, sort of zone of the ocean down to 250 meters. And that sort of follows into the next question from Bella. Thank you, Bella, for this question. Is it how does it feel um, to be in a submarine? Oh, so I did one dive uh, and this was, I mean, it's, it's a great experience. Uh, human experience first, because uh, as a diver, yes, of course, I've been uh, diving into the ocean to death almost 30, 40 meters. And uh, I expected to have this feeling 
of the divers when we've got pressure. But in fact, in the submersible, we don't have the feeling of the pressure. We just we don't feel that the submersible is sinking actually, uh, because we the, the 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 motion is so slow that we don't have this acceleration as we have when we take off, for example, in a plane. Uh, and on, the only difference that we see from the surface to the bottom is a uh, difference in light. So we see that the light fades a little bit when we go down. And we see also the landscape changing. Uh, we see a lot of life in surface with many fish, uh, sometimes sharks, sometimes uh, sea turtles. I also saw a manta ray when I was uh, around the surface. And when you go down into the ocean, uh, you see the light that is reducing, reducing, reducing. We have to put the, the projectors on in order to see what's around us. And uh, I would have expected that the, the atmosphere into the, the, the submersible was very quiet, uh, as quiet as we expect the sea to be at this depth. But in fact, inside the submersible, it's very noisy. We are permanently in contact with people uh, on deck of the ship. Uh, for security reason, uh, we do some checklists, uh, we do some test communications to see uh, if the submersible is still reachable from uh, the people on the on the ship, and um, it's it's quite it's quite reassuring to to hear the voice from our colleagues upstairs. <laughs> As, I mean, it, it sounds like this sort of other world, and uh, which is amazing and calm and peaceful, and yet you're still, for these safety reasons, these very important safety reasons, still having this chatter between yourselves and the surface vessel. And I think that's an underwater radio signal um, that allows you to do that. We've got this next question, um, which coming in uh, from Northlands um, in Bermuda. Thank you very much to the students there. Uh, we have, how do you have a live feed or internet under the water? Oh, so uh, we generally to communicate with submersibles, uh, we use um, some uh, tools that rely on the, the propagation of waves, shock waves. Uh, but uh, in this case, we are using a new technology, which is called Bluecom, which relies on light, like the, the fibers that we use for, for the phone or for television. So we uh, use this Bluecom, which is a big instrument that is deployed from the ship. And we place this instrument just above the submersible. And the submersible has also a communication unit. And between those two instruments, on the one on the submersible and the one that is uh, into the water, there there are lights exchanged. So we've got a light sensor that sends the lights, which is the emission of the information, and another instrument that receives the light, which is for communication. And because light uh, is much faster to 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 cross the ocean than uh, the sound. Uh, we can have, we can sustain very high rates of communication, which allows us to make some uh, live uh, and internet connections with the surface, and also uh, which allows the public to see what we are seeing actually when we are sitting in the submersible. I mean, I think that's absolutely amazing that this blue comm <coughs> system lowered over the side of the vessel is essentially creating a Wi-Fi hotspot under the water for the submersibles to use, but instead they're also using light to transmit their data and then that coming back to the surface vessel and then I know that you're hooked in um, to <coughs> Inmarsat to the satellite um, constellation above the planet and then that, that's being beamed up to those back to a land station and onto the sort of wired internet. For me it's exciting that we are at Sonodyne HQ who are the um, engineers who have put together Bluecom. So great to be here at the home of the organization who are making this underwater communication possible. Uh, this is a question coming on. Um, uh, this, this is um, from Mrs. Sudlow. I hope don't, you don't mind me saying, but you sound French. We are a class in a lycée in Morocco. 
and our students would like to know what studies you did. Oh, uh, I studied at the university uh, as a biologist, general biology, and uh, then I turned to ecology, general ecology, terrestrial, and I specialized in marine ecology. Then I made some uh, modeling, ecological modeling, which aims at uh, tracking the flux of carbon across uh, the marine food web. Uh, and then I specialized again into uh, biogeochemistry. It, it's, I didn't aim to do that, uh, but I met some amazing people during my studies uh, who gave me the taste of doing what I'm doing now. And I mean, Jerome, that, that's amazing. So take, taking it back all the way to, I don't, don't know whether you attended a lycée, um, but we have one watching. What kind of subjects at school uh, did you study? Or were you interested oh. in? When I was at school, uh, I was fond of biology. So I really love biology, but I was also uh, very interested in mathematics, uh, in English, of course, because I did my school uh, in France. So I'm French speaking, I'm French actually. And uh, when I went to school, I always had a passion for English and for language. Uh, but mostly biology, physics and chemistry, yes. I'm a scientist. Absolutely brilliant. So there's some inspiration for the students um, at the Lycée in Agadir. Thank you so much. Uh, we have um, from Riverside PS, we have how many, many missions have there been and where have you explored? I'm just going to give the background. So the Necton mission um, has done two missions and also been involved in the third. So the first Nectar mission was exploring the seamounts off Bermuda. Um, they were also involved in a deep uh, ocean exploration down in the Weddell Sea, um, and that is Antarctica. And this is the first of a number of expeditions in the Indian Ocean. Um, and so this is the first one in the Seychelles, and then hopefully uh, there will be more coming on to create a, a bigger picture of life um, in the Indian Ocean. Um, Serena from Jonesville Middle School. Um, coming back, uh, we talked um, just before um, the connection started about plastics. Um, really wanted to know, have you come across um, any animals injured by plastics or other pollutants that you've been able to rescue? Yes, um, I've seen some, uh, some sea turtles um, because I, I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Seychelles. So I'm living by the coastline. Uh, I'm living on an island and on a few occasions, yes, I've seen some plastics uh, on, the, on the shore. Uh, and I've rescued one sea turtle that was uh, entangled with uh, a, a, a net. Fortunately, I had a knife that I could cut the net from the, the paddles of the, of the turtle. And uh, it was amazing because I was just walking on the beach with my two kids. And uh, we saw this turtle fighting against, trying to, 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 to crawl on the, on the land. And, we could approach it very slowly and, and cut the net. Yeah, it was a great experience. And also, it's an experience that we, we made us, myself, and also made my, my two sons realize that life is nothing. We, we, we really should be more careful with what we throw out and the way we are using stuff and the way we are uh, getting rid of it. I mean, I think it's very inspiring, Jerome, to hear that, you know, you, you have that ability and you probably see the impact much more directly than we may do in other countries. Being able to be on a walk down the beach, getting the knife and, and, and cutting the, the net off, off the turtle. I mean, it must, be, must have been a sort of sad and rewarding experience at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's sad to see, to see that uh, marine life is affected even if they live very far away. You know, sea turtles, they travel thousands of kilometers in the ocean, uh, far from the coast, and they are still fighting against plastics, the same as we do on highlands, uh, where plastics is everywhere, 
and we have we really have to find ways to 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 use it uh, more sustainably and to also to to, to get rid of it uh, with intelligence and uh, and a lot of creativity sometimes yes I mean thank you very much for sharing that I think we've just got time for one or two more questions and thank you very much Jerome for for sparing your time today um, Miss Williams and, and Miss Buckley's um, students would like to know. Um, they've got a long list of, of um, sort of very interested in, in, in the animals, whether which sharks you've seen, any squid, uh, Dumbo octopus, sea pigs, and, and any other types of fish that you've seen that, that really interested you. I'm, I'm not a specialist of fish. Uh, what I've seen, uh, unfortunately not from, with my own eyes, uh, but on the video that a colleague of mine uh, took on her first dive uh, is a sunfish. A sunfish is amazing. It's just a very big fish. You know, the sunfish grows all its life. As, as long as it can find some food, it continues to grow and it can reach size of three to four meters sometimes. Uh, and the one that we saw, we cannot really estimate the size uh, because it's very hard to estimate the size without reference, especially when we are in this submersible with uh, the, 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 the round uh, the th 3, 360 view. Uh, so we don't have any reference, but uh, uh, from her experience, she told me that it was probably uh, more than two, two, two meters and a half. So this was what... This was one of the, 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 big, the, the big fish that we saw. Uh, what we saw also, uh, what I saw is um, a small creatures that is uh, at the interface between the jellyfish and the vertebrates, which is called a salp, which is a tunicate, which lives in colonies, and that makes like a belt in the ocean, and that drifts in the ocean by swimming slowly. Uh, I've seen that in pictures, I've learned that at school, but it was the first time for me uh, that I saw that in the nature. So, yes, it is was that, amazing. Is that is one of the names for that uh, siphonophore? Uh, no, it's not really a okay. siphonophore. It's close to the siphonophore. It's a salt. Okay, amazing. We'll have to get a spelling for that from you after the end of this. Um, Jerome, thank you so, so much uh, for being um, part of Submarine Live. It's been absolutely amazing to have you with us. And thank you for answering all those great questions coming in from the students. I'm afraid we've come to the end of the call. So it's going to be goodbye and thank you, Jerome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all those classes across the world who've been taking part in this last Q&A session for Submarine Live. It's been amazing to have you with us. Thank you also to the Necton First Descent team, to AXA, Excel Oceans Education and to Sonodyne for making these broadcasts possible. Uh, if you've been enjoying Submarine Live, we've got one more session, a live investigation looking at submarine pressure and design coming up in just 15 minutes. And please do join us when we are back with Arctic Live. And that is running from the 1st to the 8th of May. You can sign up at encounteredu.com forward slash live. So until our final session in just a short time, it's a goodbye from Submarine Live. Goodbye. <laughs>